Mahaprabhu's place. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's birthplace is called Navadvip Dam. Navadvip means nine islands. In the old days, when there was more water in the rivers, as we are seeing also here, the Kaveri, very less water. Uh, recently in Nepal, we saw some famous Puranic rivers. They were all but uh, a drainage canal, all that was left. Uh, some rivers, like the great Saraswati River of the Rig Veda, is completely gone for thousands of years. We are in now Kali Yuga. In Kali Yuga, slowly, slowly, things are disappearing. Things are vanishing mm. from this earth. Some people say that every day, two species of living things, maybe it's an insect, maybe it's a plant, <coughs> or something more significant, but they say that every day, two species of living things disappear from the earth forever. Mm. This is the age of Kali. Of course, we don't say correctly forever those things will all come again in Sati Yuga which follows Kali Yuga that's a long long time so in Navadvip 500 years ago there were nine islands Navadvip Dvip means island nine islands were there and these islands were created by the Ganges the Jalangi and other tributaries and branches of the Ganges in that part of the world the Ganges has hundreds of branches. The first one, as the Ganges comes from the Himalayas, it comes down across northern India through Uttar Pradesh and Bihar and then into Bengal. But at a particular point above Bengal, it starts to branch into many, 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 more and more. And, and literally it becomes hundreds of branches as it goes towards the Bay of Bengal. The first branch, the first branch to reach the Bay of Bengal, that's known as the Hubli. Hubli or Hubli? Hubli. Hubli. Hubli Ganga. It flows through modern day Kolkata under the great Howrah Bridge. It goes down towards this place called Sagar and it touches the Bay of Bengal first. So from its origin in the Himalayas to its first place where it touches, that is known as the mainstream of Ganga. <coughs> then later, all those branch, 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 hundreds of branches, slowly, slowly, they all touch the Bay of Bengal. But the first one touches just past Kolkata. And that's <coughs> Hubli. Hubli. B or G? G. G. Hubli. Huh? That's the Hubli. All are considered the Ganga, but the principal <coughs> flow of the Ganga is there. That principal flow thro flows through Navadvip. Hmm? And in those days, along with the help of some other rivers, the Ganges created nine islands. But now, if you go there today, you cannot spot nine islands. I believe there are several islands, a few remain, uh, and everything is much different than it was 500 years ago. Similarly, in Dwarka, in Krishna Leela, you see, you may read about Dwarka, but if you go to Dwarka, you can't find Dwarka actually. There is a place they call Babe Dwarka. It's an island. But it is not the island which was Krishna's Dwarka. Dwarka was on an island hmm? created in the Arabian Sea. Some land came up and Krishna built Dwarka there. Previously Krishna had resided in several other locations after leaving Vrindavan and Mathura. He settled in three places. Lastly there was the the, the famous Dwarka, as we know as Dwarka. But he stopped a few other places for some time. But after Krishna's Leela was no more manifest in the world, when his pastimes Leela were completed, then uh, one day that great Dwarka, it also vanished back into the sea. And it disappeared from the eyes of, of mortal men. Of, of humans, it vanished. So similarly, shortly after the disappearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu at the conclusion of his Leela pastimes in his 48th year, then shortly after that, Navadvip, the, the town or the village uh, in which he appeared, in which he performed many of his wonderful pastimes, that also disappeared, much like Dwarka. 
there was a great flood of the Ganges and when the flood resided the Ganges had taken a new course and the Ganges had taken much of the earth and it, the town was no more and shortly following that that land just became rice fields rice fields and for several hundred years it was known as the land of Navadweep a new city of Navadweep developed hmm, on the western side of the Ganges but it is mentioned in several places that Navadweep of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Nadia also it is called Nadia that was on the eastern side of the Ganges so in the 1800s by the 1800s um, there were very few real devotees of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu not only had the land of Nadia Navadri more or less vanished hmm, and the places of Mahaprabhu's actual birthplace which is called Yogapeed and the places where he lived and his associates lived those places were no more they could not be seen they could not be found you see well not only those physical so-called physical places uh, disappeared but also after after the disappearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu the principal teachings of Krishna Bhakti they they also disappeared they hid in the hearts of a few great souls <coughs> and many uh, we say rascals rogues different types of cheaters they began to market Krishna Bhakti here and there throughout Bengal, Bihar in Vrindavan and places mm -hmm. under the name of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu they began to market uh, uh, Krishna Bhakti and we say market it because uh, they turned it into a business they turned it into a maintenance scheme for families, for <laughs> dynasties uh, and so many things they made a business out of it generally people do business because they need money for enjoyment mm -hmm. so they marketed it and turned it into a fanciful enjoying uh, party not a real Sankirtan party in various ways they did this we don't need to go into the details of that but they did this and almost completely the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu they also disappeared mm -hmm. but as Navadri was hid under the Ganges the teachings of Mahaprabhu were hid in the hearts of some of his <coughs> pure devotees who remained in the world who continued the parampara in the world but they were so rare that they couldn't even find each other at times it was so rare and the example of this is that when Bhaktivinoda Thakur came to this world we, we don't say <coughs> that Bhaktivinoda Thakur was born according to his karma we have information from the Vedas and Puranas and, and such references and from other Sampradayas etc like Ramanuja Sampradaya, Madhva Sampradaya <coughs> that when there is a great necessity of uplifting religion and, and Krishna says it himself in Bhagavad Gita that either the Lord himself comes means an avatar comes or a chosen representative <coughs> comes and even sometimes both sometimes both comes sometimes one or the other mm -hmm. so in every Sampradaya we find that there are personalities which the people <coughs> of the Sampradaya do not consider as mortal men or mortal women mm -hmm. there are personalities there and they are regarded as divine from not even their birth from before their birth they are divine personalities of the spiritual world and they come at some appropriate time when their work is needed when their presence is needed for what? for the benefit of mankind so when there is a great need the Lord sends his representative so in the north of India in Bengal after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu things had not deteriorated to acts of physical terrorism but certainly on a spiritual level, philosophical level, the teaching of Mahaprabhu had been terrorized. And in, 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 in many ways which the Vaishnavas consider quite disgusting and deplorable and unfortunate. So almost 
darkness had descended. Bhaktivinoda Thakur appeared in this world back in 1839, I believe it was 1839. We do not say that Bhaktivinoda Thakur was born according to his karma. And I was saying that it was so difficult. There were so few Vaishnavas, they couldn't find each other. For many years, until his adult life, Bhaktivinoda Thakur could not find a Vaishnava of a similar heart as his own. It was so rare. He could not find any. Everywhere there was some great deficiency uh, from what is actually the teaching of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And so, and, and, and then, <coughs> he was so much filled with despair that at a point he prayed very, very uh, sincerely to Lord Jagannath. At that time he was a magistrate in Jagannath Puri. And he, and he was in charge of many of the fairs of Jagannath Temple and, and the town of Jagannath. He was the district magistrate. In those days, the district magistrate held a very <coughs> dignified position. Now he holds only a nominal political power, power position. But in those days, a very high position is, is, is speaking in terms of society and the British Raj and very dignified position. So Bhaktivinoda held that position as magistrate in Jagannath Puri, one of the principal <coughs> temple towns in, in India from ancient times. <coughs> So at that time he prayed to Lord Jagannath, please send me someone, uh, please send someone who will help me with my task, with this mission. So he couldn't find anyone. It's so, it, it was such a situation, he couldn't even find the copy of Chaitanya Charitamrita. But that we reason was for good reasons, <coughs> because many literatures regarding Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had begun to be tampered with. This is the way of the world. Even today, you find people doctoring the books. What do they call Cooking the books. Huh? Fudging the books in some business. Fudging the books in politics. Writing some false uh, things. All in manipulation. This is the land of manipulations and, and distortions. Huh? So many of the literatures regarding Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had also come down to that. People would miss... In those days, there were no printing press. So they would write them again and again by hand. So anybody said, I don't know why he used that word. I'd like this one. I mean, the, the little changes began. Not just arbitrary changes. They began to change the meaning of certain things. They began to add certain things to give support to their, their view of what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was about. But it appears that Krishna himself, he hid the Chaitanya Charitamrita so this wouldn't happen to it. And Bhaktivinoda, in his time, you would think it's 400 years after Mahaprabhu, it's 350 or so years after Chaitanya Chaitamrita is written, you would expect it to be available. He couldn't find it. It took years and years. He finally, finally recovered one handwritten copy. So one day I thought, oh, this must have been a divine arrangement so that Chaitanya Charitamrita would not fall into the wrong hands. The Lord himself had kept it somehow hidden and when the time was right, one copy came to Bhaktivinoda. One copy, like original quality copy, came to Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And today we have the printed version. It's practically in every country of the world. It's in numerous languages. Bengali, English, I think there's Hindi. Numerous languages around the world. But at the time of Bhaktivinoda, can't hardly find a Vaishnava. Couldn't find a uh, copy of Chaitanya Charitamrita. And at that time he prayed for uh, <coughs> Lord Jagannath to send him someone who can assist in his mission. And shortly after that time, uh, uh, his son, uh, Shul Bhakti Siddhanta, was born there in Puri. <coughs> and Bhaktivinoda may have not, well he, well, he did not think maybe immediately, no one knows for sure, whether this son was the answer to his prayer or not. He didn't specify how to send that person. They may come in a chariot, they may come on a horse, they may come as a beggar on my door. He didn't say how. Uh, but on the day that when Bhakti Siddhartha was a small child and his mother took him out of the house for the first time, that's an old customary thing, an old uh, samskara. 
which people used to observe, the child leaving the house for the first time, etc. That just happened to be the Rathiyatra time. And it just so happened to be that Lord Jagannath's cart had broken down, broke a wheel, and was sitting in front of Bhakti Vinod's house on Car Street in Puri for three days. So then the time came for the mother to perform the ceremony, and so she took the child out of the house for the first time and took the child up on Lord Jagannath's cart. So that was a doubly auspicious moment. And Bhakti Vinod was some, they, the story is he was some other place attending to affairs of Rathiyatra. And the mother placed, of course, she's the magistrate's wife, so she's got access all the way up to the feet of Jagannath. So she laid the, 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 the baby on the, near the, to the feet of Jagannath, and he <coughs> said that a garland broke from Jagannath's neck and just came tumbling down and poof, landed on the child. So all the priests said, oh, very auspicious, very auspicious. And they kept the garland with the child, and she took the child away. Later, some people reported to Bhakti Vinod, Oh, you were very fortunate. Your child is blessed. Today, Jagannath gave his garland. But when he heard that, then he remembered his prayer. And he connected the two. And then he told his wife, we were told that he told his wife, Take a special care. Take, don't neglect. I think that the Lord has sent his servant to help me. He named him Bimal Prashad. <coughs> Bimal Prashad. So, he didn't name him as a Krishna Prashad, as a Chaitanya Prashad, he didn't name him as a Jagannath Prashad, he named him as Bimal Prashad. I was wondering, Bimal Prashad, why Bimal Prashad? Then, it just so happened a few days later, we went to visit uh, uh, Srila Bhakti Pramod Puri Maharaj. And we were in his room, and suddenly, somebody raised the question about Bhakti Siddhanta's name at birth, Bimal Prashat. He said, in Jagannath Temple, there is a Devi Temple that is known as Bimal Devi. He said, Bimal Devi is the Yoga Maya of Jagannath. Hmm? Bimal Devi is, is manifesting all the arrangements uh, for Lord Jagannath's pastimes, Jagannath's Leela. Hmm? And Bhakti Vinod named Bhakti Siddhanta Bimal Prashat uh, because... Uh, he will he will reveal the pastimes of Mahaprabhu. Then I felt very good. Yes, now I got the real answer. What is Bhimal Prashad? The mercy of Bhimal Devi, the internal potency, <coughs> the Yoga Maya potency, who is going to reveal to the world Mahaprabhu's lila. That would be Bhakti Siddhanta. So Bhimal Prashad. So that was the very special feature also of associating or having a darshan with Sri Puri Maharaj. You always got the right terms and you came to the most perfect conclusions uh, in the course of it. So, um, so Bhakti Vinod Thakur, then Bhakti Siddhanta was born in 1874, 1874. Now, people argue, they say, oh, no, 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 Bhakti Vinod Thakur, by his own admission, he is an ordinary man, you see. He was non vaginal in a particular lifetime. He had other uh, social habits or something like that, you know. And uh, he was a Mayavadi. He also was a Mayavadi. By his own admission, he's told these things. So you see, he's also an ordinary man. But where is there any uh, pure soul by his own admission will tell you, oh yes, you see, I'm, just a, I'm a pure soul. I've always been pure. I was born pure. If you accept it only by uh, their own admission, they'll all say, I'm a fallen soul. I am a rascal, number one. Uh, I, am, I am a fool. Huh? And anyone who tells you anything different, know for sure he's a fool. <laughs> he's a rascal. <laughs> so it becomes very difficult. You cannot find a real enlightened personality or a real pure devotee or a liberated soul or someone who's descended by asking them. Hmm? You can't know in that, in that way. About the only one that I can think of was Srila Prabhupada. And I mentioned this more times than one, because he came to a world that said God was dead. That was the propaganda that he, he met when he came to America. People were saying, God is dead. If there was a God, he died by now. And he'd say, no, he didn't. I have seen him. <laughs> Otherwise, how, how do you win the argument? It's just belief. They're asserting he's dead. The spaceman, one spaceman, right, went up to space. And he reported, I went there. I didn't see any God. 
You don't, you don't have the eyes to see. You can't see the back of your own head either. You need help. If you take a mirror, you may see. If you take the help of Guru, you may see. But generally, the Vaishnavas do not reveal themselves boldly like that. That's, that's the nature of a Vaishnava. Hidden, hidden type of nature, not in your face type of nature. So if people say like that, then he became liberated soul. So there is a, there is an argument out there, there is a debate. Was Bhakti Thakur a liberated soul from his birth? We say that he was, and we have written about that, and we have many things to say. We doesn't just mean me, and Vishnu Maharaj, etc., but that mean, we means Bhakti Siddhanta and many Vaishnavas since then, including Prabhupada, based <coughs> on his uh, life, based on his achievements, and based on his writings, writings before he met the uh, the infamous Bipin Bihari <coughs> Swami, who people say was the source of the enlightenment of Bhakti Vinod. We have things which Bhakti Vinod Thakur has done, said, and written before that, they cannot come from a conditioned soul. They, they, that they certify his being a liberated soul. And more importantly, that is certified by other great personalities, parmanas, souls. But nonetheless, the argument goes on. No one's defeated in this day and age. When Ramanuja was here, he debated with some uh, Jains in this place called Tananur, about 45 minutes drive from here, and he defeated them. All right? And after he defeated them, they kept on their nonsense. He went to the king and complained and said they should either surrender or cut their heads off. They have been defeated. In the old days, when you were defeated, if you didn't surrender, then you were banished from society. And if you were pushy about it, you may be given the death sentence. <coughs> What was said and what people said and what people believed was a very big part of society thousands of years ago. Now, two people have a debate, they have an argument, one person is victorious, the other one just goes on talking his nonsense again and again, shows up two months later with the same argument. We say, what? We've already, this argument already been dealt with for a hundred years. It has been defeated 25 or 30 times. And again, the same argument. That's the nature of Kali Yuga. They go on like this. But about Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, you can scrape the pages of history, you cannot find any small thing in one day of his life that indicates that maybe he's not a pure soul from birth. So both Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta in our Parampara, they are accepted as the liberated souls who appeared in this world just as Ramanuja is the <coughs> Ramanuja line and Madhva and Madhva line and uh, I, I believe since Ramanuja and Madhva there have been other great personalities also who have come in their lines Maya has her line of thought Maya has her line of agents the Supreme Lord also has his agents he has his line that is known as Parampara so it was the first and primary work of Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Bhakti Siddhanta to rediscover the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Along with their many writings and their poetries and their preaching and their Sankirtan, it was their principal work. A work that nowadays is sometimes given second booking, as we say, second, as kind of rated second class. Uh, maintaining the Holy Dhamma. Maintaining the Holy Dham, discovering the Holy Dham. It just so happens if people live in Vrindavan or live in Mayapur, they are often second rated to people who are preaching outside in the world. But actually, that was the primary work of Bhakti Nara Thakur and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta to reestablish the birthplace of Mahaprabhu and along with that birthplace, the places of his past lives to again manifest the eternal abode of Navadvip for the benefit of the world. And primarily they did this. They did this based on a statement by Nityananda Prabhu, Sri Nityananda Prabhu. He once, or maybe more than once, but it's recorded once, he made a statement 
that says, there will be a wonderful temple built at the site of Sri Chaitanya's birth. And from this temple, the Sankirtan of the Holy Name will spread all over the world. So, first the, what did they say? First the carriage, then the horse. There's a way. You know, first the shoe, then the shoestrings. There's some way of things. It's not just any way you like it. First unzip the coat before you can put it on. There's a way of things. So spiritually, that's material. Even spiritually, it's even more important. There's a subjective way of things. The Lord did not come here to please our senses. He did not come here to serve us. He came here to give an opportunity for us to serve Him. Service first. Surrender is necessary. Service without surrender is actually not service. It's something we call preliminary practice, but it is not the real thing. There must be surrender, then there can be service. So they knew it, that before the Sankirtan movement of Mahabharata can spread all over the world, the place of his appearance must be manifest again in this world. And it, along with it being manifest, there must be a great temple must be built there. And then from this, then the potency will go and spread all over the world. Now, some people are of the opinion that first the Sankirtan will spread all over the world, and after it spreads all over the world, then all the foreigners will come to India and build that wonderful temple. <coughs> so there's some confusion is there. But what Nityananda Prabhu says, he says, a great temple, it's called an Adbhut Mandir, means a wonderful, beautiful temple, will be built at the birth site of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And from that temple, then it will go all over the world. So Bhakti Vinod and Bhakti Siddhanta, not being conditioned souls, not being from the Judeo-Christian background, not being foreigners and not being egotistical in so many things, they knew that first the order of the Lord must be served. The order of God must be served first, according to His direction, what He wants. And then accordingly, the Sankirtan will be successful. So that was their primary work. But they didn't even know where to begin, in one sense, because it was all hidden. They knew a vague location. But there's a saying in the English language, uh, look and you will find. Seek and ye shall find. It's an old saying. You try. It means you try. God is there to help you. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I preserve what you have, and I carry what you lack. And when the need is there, I will be there to help you. So with this fundamental understand, they, understanding, they searched and they looked in various ways in trying to locate where this is. There was, of course, a place people were saying, well, why look, it's here. Huh? When going to that place, it's in the, it's in the greater Navadvik Dham, but Bhakti Vinod did not feel confident that this is actually Mahaprabhu's birthplace. There were several reasons for that, but <coughs> he did not feel confident. Uh, even his his mantra guru said, this is the place. And he did not feel confident with that, because that mantra guru of Bhakti Vinod was not a liberated soul. And he was, uh, he was with a, a group of much less than liberated souls. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur continued to search and first he looked through the available sacred text, books. And the first thing that they ascertained was that Navadvip, the, the ancient town of Navadvip, is on the eastern side of the Ganges, not on the western <coughs> side. And according to what they could see, because you can understand, if a river was somewhere yesterday, it's sure. Right now, if water did not flow in the Kaveri for 200 years, you would be able to see, without any difficulty whatsoever, where the Kaveri used to go. That river bed would not disappear in one or 200 years. It takes a long, long time before a river bed disappears. So, on the other side of Navadri, they could find nothing to indicate that the Ganges was there. They found only to indicate the Ganges is this side. Somewhere, this side. Of course, it was here. But, see, this is east, this is west. 
and Navadvip is here. It's on the wrong side. So Navadvip is on this side. So that means the Ganges would have to come this side. But they found no possibility that the river could come on this side. So they knew it must be here. So first through textbooks that are written, and that means scriptural books that mention Navadvip and its location and so forth. But ultimately it came down to divine revelation. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he had a vision, as we say. He caught a glimpse of the eternal Navadvip in a particular direction, which caught his attention. And he saw this on more than one occasion from his rooftop. He would look out towards what he thought was the area of the eternal Navadvip, the place of Mahabhava's pastimes, which was all rice fields and a couple of Mohammedan villages. <coughs> No Hindu village was even there in that area. And one day in the early, early morning while chanting his japa, he got a glimpse, a divine glimpse of the eternal Vaikuntha Navadvi, the Swetha Dweep of Navadvi. And I believe this occurred on more than one occasion. And then he went in that direction with Srila Bhakti Siddhanta in search of what may be lying there, and again, mostly rice fields. But on one day, while searching the area, they came to this place near to a village. Some land was there, owned by a Mohammedan, and there was a natural Tulsi garden was being maintained there. Well, Mohammedans don't really care much about Tulsi. But this Mohammedan, for some no reason, he was maintaining a Tulsi garden. And when they entered that area, the Tulsi garden, then Martin Rod could feel the presence of his own homeland, so to speak. Sometimes you're looking for something and you go in a store and you come, this is not the place. And then you come in, oh, this is it. There's some feeling comes to you, some knowing. We are not feelingless creatures. Actually, feeling is your best way of knowing, ultimately, in the last issue. Feeling is, is the most important instrument. In the beginning, you have to hear. You have to accept. And ultimately, you have to feel truth in your own heart and know it by such. Not because I said so, because somebody else said so. It has to come by revelation, by feeling, by realization. So when he entered that garden, he felt, oh, this is a divine place. This is a divine place. And he held that place in suspicion, this may be, this may be, this may be the place of Mahaprabhu's birth. So at that time, during those times, but you know, Thakur had come to know Jagannath Das Babaji as his Shikshu Guru and really as his, his Sadguru, it is called Sadguru, really fully his Guru. And this other fellow who was more or less a social icon of the Guru establishment, but you know, always gave a formal respect, but his heart was at one with Jagannath Das Babaji. And Jagannath Das Babaji was Paramahansa, the Brigid Saul also. So, the way of the Vaishnavas is not without confirmation. You think something, you know something, you don't get your head as big as a horse or an elephant and think, yes, yes, I know, no one can tell me. I have seen some successful preachers after getting a thousand or two thousand disciples and they get this attitude, no one can tell me, I know what I'm doing, no one can tell me, I know what I'm doing. But that is never the way, really, of the Vaishnava. Even the greatest Vaishnava, he, he yearns for some confirmation, some association, right? someone even to talk to about those higher things, those important things. So Bhakti Vinod didn't think, well, I'm a liberated soul, I know what I'm doing, no one can tell me, this is Mahaprabhu's place, said and done. He brought Jagannath Das Babaji there. Now the story is that Jagannath Das Babaji was so old at that time, he generally never walked anywhere. He would be carried in a basket, which was a system, and, the, and of course the most of the community had arranged a servant, a good strong man who would carry him wherever he needed to go in a basket. He was something <coughs> up over 110 years old or something like that at the time. So Bhakti Vinod arranged to bring Jagannath Das Babaji there, and who was also blind at the time, means not much use for looking through from the eyes anymore, although he did wear glasses, like Sri Sridhar Maharaj, he wore glasses, but with or without, it was the same thing in his old age, he couldn't see. So when Bhakti Vinod wanted to bring Jagannath Das Babaji there to see if, you know, Babaji 
had any uh, experience there uh, of, of note. Well, he certainly did. When he got there, before the man could even set down the basket, Jonah, who was blind, who didn't even know where he was, jumped out of the basket. And when he landed on the ground, he started dancing and performing kirtan. And he was at an age where he couldn't even walk, or to speak of jump out of a basket. And he couldn't see where he was. As far as he knows, he could have been anywhere. But with the internal eye of devotion, he could understand that he was in the yoga feet. He had been brought to the epicenter of Chaitanya Lee. So that must have been a, a more than ecstatic moment for the few blessed souls that were there at that time. So then, based on Jagannath's experience, then Bhakti Manod, he took the resolve, this is Yogi. Then he set out to prove it through other historical, archaeological evidences, literary evidences, notations and here and there, and all around from every possible way, he proved this is the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But without any of the evidences, he knew it is so because of the experience of Jagannath Das Babaji, what he manifested there. Do you follow? That is what we do. I don't know if I'm the spirit soul or not. I don't know if Krishna is God or not. I don't know. But my guru knows. My guru knows. And that's good enough for me. And then I know it's true. And then I can argue and put scripture and make defense and show archaeology and everything to prove that. Huh? But if I didn't know from the point, sure, it is sure, huh? then how would I know? I wouldn't know. That's the way of Vaishnavism. You don't know. Your guru knows. And based on that, you know. Some people recently, in the last few years, they said guru knows everything. He knows if someone's snatching money. He knows if someone is dying. He knows if someone ate too much sweet rice. He knows if someone's <laughs> burning the sweet rice. He knows all these things. We thought, my God, you must be crazy. <laughs> you know all these things. You can't even sit in a room with three people talking. You go, hey, shut up. Too many talks. Huh? And we have seen <clears throat> Prabhupada in the same way. They're not in a room, everybody talking and just adjusting all of that. They want some peace and quiet themselves. Understand? But some people are saying, Guru, he knows everything. He knows everything. And, 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 and Prabhupada had said, yes, Guru knows everything means Krishna. He knows Krishna. Krishna is everything. So he knows everything is Krishna. If Krishna reveals something, he may know that. If Krishna doesn't reveal that, how no, he will know that. So, because of Jagannath Das Babaji, Bhakti Vinod's commitment, <coughs> resolve, yes, we have found the place of God. <coughs> now, for the ordinary people who don't have Guru Nishta, Guru Bhakti, Guru Shraddha, okay, you have to convince them by different arguments because people will challenge your faith. Your pure faith won't hold up in court. You'll need evidence. And it went to court. It went to the court. And they uh, sustained uh, the birthplace of Mahabharata as Yogi in the court. And finally, the governor of Bengal, who was the second most powerful man and the third most powerful man in the world. First there was the king and queen of England, then there was the viceroy at Delhi, and then there was the governor of Bengal, the third most powerful man in the world, came to Mayapur, and there's a picture of him sitting in a chair, and there's a silver thing on the desk. Well, inside that silver canister is the hear ye, hear ye proclamation that says that Yogapit and, 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 and gives its location is the birthplace of Mahaprabhu. So he even went so far as to get the third most powerful person in the world to verify this. For who? So that the fools may not be misguided by the cheaters across the river who are claiming some place of Mayapur just to collect money to maintain family and things like that. Their temple was built there, interesting point to note. Their temple was built there. They built some temple, call it wonderful even. They built a temple there long before Bhakti Vinod. But the prediction <coughs> never came true. After they built their temple, the holy name of Krishna, Mahaprabhu's name, never spread all over the world. Then Bhakti Vinod and Bhakti Sananta, they built and inaugurated this temple at Yogapit. And from there, Krishna consciousness has gone all over the world. 
you are hard pressed to find a place in the world, even in, in the aboriginal cultures or even in the isolated parts of the world, that you can go there and nobody heard a Krishna. I mean, it's, that there's not somebody that doesn't go, oh, Hare Krishna. The point is, from Yogapi, the temple built by Bhakti Vinod and Bhakti Siddhanta, and then the disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta are not to be excluded, uh, but it starts there. Uh, from there, all of them came to join. Uh, they came to be the servants of Bhakti Siddhanta. From there, they were instructed what to do. They went out and did that. Princ principally among them, Srila Prabhupada. He came to the far, far distant western hemispheres with Krishna consciousness. And now many descendants of Bhakti Siddhanta's disciples and grand disciples, they can be found all over the world, from Siberia to South Africa, from New York to London, they're all over the place. Huh? And nobody from that other place is anywhere except on the internet complaining. They are nowhere and doing nothing to fulfill the prophecy that from Yogapi, the holy name will spread all over the world. So, Kalena Priya Prichite, you judge the pudding by the taste. Huh? The rice might look good, but when you eat it, you'll know if it's cooked or not. You see? The proof is in the pudding, they say. Huh? It's different expressions. So, anyone can say, and everyone's saying, but who actually did it? Who did it and who's still doing it? Those who have their connection with Navadrik Dham, Mayapur, Bhakti Vinod, Bhakti Siddhanta, they're doing it. And the others are like the crows who come and sit in the tree and criticize everything beneath them. They just make criti critical statements. <laughs> or they say the dogs bark when the caravan passes. So many elephants are going on the road and the local dogs come out and make sound. But the elephants continue and gradually the sound of the dogs and just die. So these critics of Bhakti Vinod and Bhakti Siddhanta, they are no more than crows or barking dogs, actually. Unfortunately, they'll probably have to take that species of life in their next life. They'll probably have to become dog and crow and possibly even worse. I mean, it's one thing not to know about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's not to know about Krishna, not to know about those great souls. It's one thing not to know, understand? And it is a completely other thing that you know and you criticize it and you fight against it. Better to remain in ignorance for another million lifetimes and you just don't know. And you just live according to your karma. And then one day you will, you will know the truth and you will act on that and you will go back to God. But when you come in connection with the truth and then you criticize it and you fight against it and you try to trouble it and now they are drunk. And they don't even believe in Krishna. Listen, those same people who are making all the Hong Kong Kong, huh? giving up all designation of a Hindu, a uh, Vaishnava, not even considering themselves a Hindu. <laughs> or I am a drunkard Brahmin. And in the meantime, Krishna consciousness went on. The parade went <clears throat> on. The dogs barked. Most of it is better to be an ignorant person in the rice field. You just don't know. You don't know you should come here. You don't know. You just don't know. So anything you do wrong at that point, well, okay. Some reaction, but not so bad. But you know, and then you fight against that truth. That Then you, you categorize as the most unfortunate creatures in the universe. It's sad, but it happens. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission now in 500 years has had different high points and down points. But here we are 518 years later. And the holy name of Krishna is out there on every continent. <coughs> it's just out there in every major city and town and practically right down the farm village in the world. It's out there. But there's always somebody that doesn't know yet. You see, There's somebody even <coughs> living in India. I have seen amongst the young people, particularly young people, not just the young, but particularly the young, living in India, and it's just like, I wonder, how they got born in India? Why they even got born here? They should have been born in Brooklyn, New York or something. But, and, and they're born in, a, born in a certain environment, modern halls, modern this, and I, and I doubt if some of them even know who Ganesh is. In the Hindu family, and probably don't even know Ganesh, what to speak of Krishna, what to speak of Mahaprabhu. 
for they are born within a day's train ride of the holy land of Navadri, more or less, or within an hour or two hour flight. They are so close, but yet they are so far away. So to preach Krishna consciousness in Mahaprabhu's mission, one doesn't have to go to the other side of the world. There are plenty of people just within a few hundred meters of this gate who still do not know the importance of their life, how to perfect their life, what is Krishna, what is devotion, what is the holy name of Krishna, what is the grace of Mahaprabhu, within a few hundred meters of this ashram. And even amongst us, how clearly do we understand that? Ourselves also. So we don't have to go all anywhere and everywhere in the world to preach. You can do that right here in the ashram. You can do that right here in the village or right here in your own state. You see? But the fact is, this little ashram and the people that are here and the people that some some of them that aren't here that help this ashram, a tremendous amount of, of, of service to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gets done from this place. And that cannot be just by human endeavor. Not just because we have money. I know people with so much money that they can't get any service done. They can't even think of some service practice. But they have money. So money alone does not enable us to serve Krishna. Serve Mahaprabhu. But it requires some blessing, some divine grace, some, some inspiration is necessary. And when that is there, we'll be able to serve even if Lakshmi hasn't built her palace here yet. And, and funds and money and such might be in a little less. Still we'll be able to do things. But without the blessing of our Acharyas, without the blessings of the Supreme Lord, even if we're Kurpatis or multimillionaires, we won't be able to do much, much good. First thing is necessary is their blessing. Then service will follow. Not that we'll get money, then we'll do service, and then we'll offer that to them because they need it. No, they don't need it. The Lord doesn't need it. God doesn't need anything we do. The argument is there. People say, oh, I offer food to God. He doesn't need any food. God gave you the food. Yes, we say we're like his children. He likes to see us feed him. But we feel, no, no, what do you say? He needs our food. Bhakti says, actually, he needs our food. He, has, he must eat. Okay. What if you're having a feast? You're eating, and then you're finished. You sit back. Oh, you're finished. Then your mother says, oh, I forgot to offer you the sweet. Then she offers you the sweet. Okay. The same thing. When you're cooking, and the offering is made, and Krishna's plate is made, and the offering is made, and then somebody goes, oh, we forgot to offer the sweet. Well, then go offer it to him. He's there. Somebody take it and go back inside with the cup and give Krishna a sweet. If you were sitting at the table, isn't that what we would do? Huh? So don't think that Krishna is made of stone. He's just a stone. And you place a ritual. And after that, oh, time is over. What's the name? <coughs> well, the next time we forget to give you the sweet rice, we'll say, oh, never mind. Time is over. <laughs> we'll say, never mind the time. Give the sweet rice. <laughs> so devotees think of Krishna as something real, not something surreal, not something false, something absolutely real. So his blessings, the blessings of Srimati Radharani, the blessings of Mahaprabhu, Gornitai, all these things in our acharyas, they're necessary. So first we should try in our personal behavior, in our exercises, in our service, the things we do to please them in our life, then we will have success. Just like Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Bhakti, uh, Bhakti Siddhanta, they knew for the Holy Name to spread all over the world, the service of Mayapur was essential. And they gave, and, and they went out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, in those days, the middle of nowhere. It took two days to get there, even by train. Now you get in three hours by car. But it took two days to get there by train, or two days to get there by boat. And it was just literally, it makes this look like a metropolis. You see, it was just out there in Bengal, off the Ganges, in just rice fields. There was nothing out there worth going out there for. In fact, it's dangerous. That's why it took two days to get there. Because you would reach there just at night, but you didn't dare cross the Ganges in the night, or the river pirates would rob you. It was, a, it was a treacherous area, you see, because Maya had come all around, and Maya's agents 
Ganges River pirates, Dakoids, <laughs> Gundas, they were in plenty. But they knew this must be established according to the wish of the Supreme Lord first. <clears throat> and then the great good can be done to all the world. And they did it in that way. So we should understand what is to be done first and how to progress properly in our spiritual life. Not think that we would just jump to the final degree position uh, when actually we have not finished the first course. We want to take the last course. And so many things follow that way of thinking. You understand? So this is a good day to remember that the appearance of Mahaprabhu everything by his grace so we should sincerely pray for his grace and if we're not telling prayer actually although you can tell prayer and you can recite many prayers and slokas giving the blessings of Mahaprabhu even if you're not doing that in your mind of minds <coughs> you should all remember we should all remember everything by his grace if we were to have any success in this world only by his grace go primitive <laughs>